So first, uh, I just want to give you an overview of what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, we'll talk a bit about why it's so important to take this work for better health on and how we can transform common health challenges through better food choices. And then uh, just kind of a broad overview, then we'll move into the four uh, core dietary pillars, which are uh, some of the highest impact protocols that one can take in terms of health and wellness. So we'll start with the foundational pillar one, which is eat a whole foods diet. Then we'll move into the second pillar, which is reduce uh, sugar and refined carbs. Uh, then pillar three is eat good fats and ditch bad fats. Pillar four is indulge in a rainbow of vegetables and a bit of fruit. And then uh, finally, we'll do a QA. and a We'll actually do an, uh, a Q&A somewhere in the middle as well, just to break it up and make sure things are clear and people are, are getting what they need. Um, so my goal with the webinar is to give you enough information to start making positive changes without even having to read the book. Uh, it's not so much about the book, it's just about uh, really learning some stuff. And that being said, uh, there's of course no way in this shorter time period. I'm going to mute everybody. If you can't all mute yourselves, but I'm gonna mute everybody. Get a little echo, perfect. Cool. Um, but anyway, uh, there's, there's a lot more information in the book than of course I could cover in this, but I think there'll be plenty of helpful uh, tidbits and information to get you rolling if this is your, your main trajectory. So in terms of the Q&A, um, I would encourage everyone to get some paper and write down any questions as we go so you can ask it all at the end. I'll mostly just keep rolling during the presentation and won't be able to look at the questions and comments in the chat. I'm not that uh, multitasking talented. Uh, but I will do, as I said, a little uh, mini, you know, five, 10 minute Q&A about halfway through. It'll be right after pillar number two, um, you know, just to make sure um, everyone's on the same page to see how everybody's feeling uh, and to see if there's any needs for clarification on anything I've shared. And then we'll have a long one at, longer one at the end, hopefully around 20 minutes or so. And I'm happy to even stay on longer if folks want to. So let's get started. Before we get into the four pillars again, I wanna just talk um, some about the big picture and why it is that you should take on cultivating better nutritional health. I'll start uh, by exploring some of the health challenges that many face and review some of the benefits that can come with a healthier diet. So let's uh, start with some of the common challenges people face and that can be improved by diet. PowerPoint, okay, cool. So the nutritional pillars that I'm gonna share with you during this webinar can help in the following ways to varying degrees uh, for different people, uh, but they can prevent and in many cases reverse some diseases like type two diabetes, just to name one. Uh, they can generate more energy and vitality, improve mood, uh, help you lose unwanted weight without worrying so much about calories. You can really eat plenty of the good stuff. They can help improve blood sugar and cholesterol, um, shed body aches and pains, clear up foggy headedness, which was a big one for me, uh, create really vibrant skin, uh, help you experience better sleep and a lot more, but those are obviously some of the cool highlights. And this is all backed up by the research, by the way. It's, it's uh, from a lot of experience from people I work with, and, and there's lots of data behind all these things about how much food impacts you, and we'll talk about that. So it's, I think it's easier than many people think uh, to make positive shifts with many of the challenges on that list. And every step you take, even the small ones, are going to make a difference. It'll all be a positive change and hopefully a manageable one. Uh, when you're armed with good information and tools for support. And it's all a big pivot from the standard American diet, or as many call it, the SAD diet, into a more healthy and nutrient-dense diet that focuses on eating uh, delicious, fresh, whole foods. And I know, you know, 
Many of you might think you can't live without some of the unfavorable foods that you really love. For me, it was like white rice or cheap starchy breads, um, particularly desserty pastries. Those are my favorites. Uh, but there are countless other bad staples in most of our daily diets that you may not be used that you may be used to eating. But I want to urge you not to worry too much. When you get used to the textures and the deep flavors of whole foods of good quality, your body systems and your taste buds will change for the better. You'll find the subtleties of good food to be more than just satiating. They can be deeply satisfying. And I, for one, have uh, more than adjusted to this new way of eating. Um, you know, so for me, being on the other side of these changes, I now enjoy food even more than I did before. And that's partly because the more complex and nuanced flavors now have space on my tongue to dance around a bit and to feel appreciated. Before they were overwhelmed by the, the hyper flavorings of processed foods, things like intense sweeteners and fake seasonings or cheap fats and refined grains designed to act essentially like a nuclear explosion on the tongue um, and in the body. Uh, junk foods that I once found tasty or had intense cravings for now often overwhelm me and seem cheap and hollow and my taste buds and body's desires have transformed. There's a whole new world of delightful flavors and experiences to be had with food when you give yourself over to quality. And I just want to prove the point, show you some photos from my own kitchen uh, as examples of what a typical meal might look like. Um, so off to the left, you'll see a butter, stuffed butternut squash with lots of fresh veggies and whatever your favorite protein is, really hearty and delicious. Um, I've got some chocolate chip cookies, which is pretty wild. I know for a lot of people to think that could be healthy food. And while these are not, I wouldn't say healthy, I like to call them healthy-ish in quotation marks, um, they're made out of almond flour which is a great alternative uh, to wheats and grains. And they uh, don't spike your blood sugar as much. I, I make them with less sugar. And when, you know, we're all inevitably gonna crash and need our comfort foods. And there's a lot of fun sheets that I like to highlight. And I'll, I'll share some more resources about that in a few minutes. Uh, every day for lunch, just about, I have a giant salad, a really nutrient dense salad full of um, lots of greens and, uh, my favorite vegetables, I like using leftover vegetables. It's fun to have cold leftover vegetables in, nuts and seeds and berries and um, my favorite protein. I love pumpkin seeds and, and, uh, and sunflower seeds are my favorite. I get uh, sprouted uh, raw organic and they're delicious in there. Uh, then there's a pizza, which again, another crazy thing. But what I do to make the pizza better is I'll use like on this one in the picture, I used a cassava crust. Cassava is this uh, low glycemic, it's prebiotic, meaning that it feeds your good gut bugs. And low glycemic, by the way, means it doesn't spike your blood sugar, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes is a really rough thing to do. And so it is really tasty. I, it's so delicious. It tastes very similar to, to wheat. Uh, I also often will buy um, almond flour crust that are frozen, which make great fun pizzas. And then I just load them full of nutrient dense vegetables, all my favorite toppings, uh, my favorite protein, lots and lots of herbs. And it's incredible. I don't, I don't do this every day and not even every week, but I, I do it regularly when I'm craving. Uh, I have a little bowl of spiralized noodles on the left. These are made out of vegetables and you can spiralize them like they're noodles and replace them for pastas. And they're really yummy. With, again, loads of vegetables and herbs and favorite protein. Uh, and I've got a fun dessert little, these are my uh, pumpkin custard uh, recipe that I kind of hybridize and it's so yummy. And I use just, again, I use less sugar. I might use coconut sugar, which is a little bit less sugar or some maple syrup in smaller amounts. And I use, uh, in these particular ones, I used coconut milk instead of dairy, which I have a challenge with. And they're delicious, really yummy. So you can see these are all fairly hearty. I, I can tell you they're delicious and they're relatively healthy foods and I'm not depriving myself. I really enjoy eating and I often overeat, but I'm eating at least things that are, are healthier. Uh, I rarely feel like I'm missing out. 
Uh, and so again, some of these pictures are treats. I don't have as often, but I can still indulge when I really feel I need some comfort food. Okay, so for the next few minutes, let's talk a little bit about our collective health. As a culture, many of our health indicators are declining, particularly because of the impact of negative epigenetic factors. And for your information, epigenetics are the expression of genes through the interplay between our innate genetic makeup, what we're born with, and nutritional, environmental, and lifestyle factors, and how they influence them. So it's really a fallacy that our genes alone dictate health. We can actually turn on or off bad and good genes, depending on those factors, and food being one of the most impactful. So some of the bad news is that chronic disease rates in the United States and around the world are skyrocketing. And experts believe that changes in our collective food choices and culture-wide eating habits are some of the primary causes. So here are some examples. 60% of Americans have one chronic disease and 40% have two or more chronic diseases. 70% uh, of Americans are either overweight or obese. 40% uh, are obese. And that's up, listen to this, this is up from 40% right now. This is up from 3.4% in 1962. So some, some pretty remarkable shifts. And this doesn't simply impact adults either. Chronic disease rates among children between 1994 and 2006 have doubled. And sadly, these disturbing trends continue upward and they, they cut across the age spectrum. So it's also very important to note that our ancient ancestors eight whole foods diets. Uh, we've now defaulted heavily towards processed foods and refined grains and oils, which as you'll learn are literally toxic to our bodies and creating a lot of these problems. And our ancestors didn't have the kind of modern metabolic diseases we have. They often died from injuries or infections or viruses, uh, not from uh, heart disease and cancer and things like we have now, at least not to the level we do now. Okay, so to bring these points home, I'm just going to share for a few minutes about my own health journey with all of you. So I've been studying um, healthy eating for about 30 years to varying degrees of depth. I started my curiosity and at times obsession when I was in my teens. I've always tried to eat what I thought was healthy food. Then finally, in my early 40s, I started a much more rigorous journey of figuring out what the best health protocols were for me to follow. And the reason I did this was that as the years progressed, I noticed my body slowly drifting into more challenges, and it was really degrading. Uh, the thing is, I felt sicker and sicker as the years progressed, and I was more run down and with overall devolving health. It was definitely not feeling fun. Uh, my back started to hurt in my mid-20s and deteriorated to the point where I really couldn't sit for more than about 10 minutes without wanting to squirm out of my skin in discomfort and pain. Um, by my mid-30s, I was tired almost every afternoon. And, you know, the kind of tired where I could visualize and desire just laying on the floor anywhere wouldn't matter. And immediately I could have fallen asleep. Um, Throughout my 20s, I could sleep nine or 10 hours, no sweat. By my 40s, I had and far too many short, restless, and fitful nights of sleep. My joints started to get pretty creaky too by my mid-30s. I'd get out of bed and, and hear myself groan like my grandfather had every time he got out of his big recliner when I was growing up, which was uh, also pretty concerning. So uh, I also, when I would get my annual physicals and, and my blood work, my blood sugar was higher than it should have been. Not quite pre-diabetes, but higher than ideal. And this was happening pretty consistently. I was getting rather concerned. Uh, my cholesterol wasn't looking great either. I started really feeling foggy headed most of the time. Um, I couldn't focus very well and my thinking often felt muddy. Um, it, it was really challenging for work meetings. Uh, I, would, I would get this brain fog and I'd be in meetings and just feel really inadequate and, and embarrassed that I just couldn't seem to string a sentence together. It was getting really uh, making me very nervous about where I was headed. Uh, also by my 30s, I was getting progressively more irritating skin issues like odd itchy rashes, 
um, flaky scalp, frequent canker sores, and minor but annoying acne on my face. I'll, I'll definitely tell you I did not think I was supposed to have acne in my 30s. That was pretty uh, irritating in particular. Um, by my early 40s, I'd also put on about 20 additional pounds for my leanest adult weight. And, you know, at almost six feet tall, that 20 pounds wasn't classified as being terribly overweight, but I wasn't enjoying the growing gut or widening face at all. And, you know, soon after I made this uh, deep internal commitment to change my diet, I really dove in. And I, I dove in uh, to my research, too. I read quite a few books, tons of blogs, I listened to countless hours of nutritional podcasts and started to try things out. I tried more dietary healing strategies than most people I think even know exist. It was certainly more than I'd heard of before, and I was just digging in. Um, the most important areas I stumbled upon were the interrelated worlds of functional medicine, uh, anti-inflammatory and paleo or ancestral diets. And I took on their lower carb, low sugar, uh, healthier fat diets. When it started to work, uh, and they were the things that really started to work, it felt kind of like magic. Uh, even within the first week, I felt so much better in some key ways. I was getting clear headed. I had more energy and many of my aches and pains were noticeably lightening. After the first couple of months on my protocol in some key ways, I felt like a different person. And over the years, it's continued to build upon itself. Uh, things like my back pain have drastically reduced. I'd say about 60 to 70% improvement since then. Uh, I feel really better now than I think I've ever felt in my life, certainly in my adult life in terms of my health and vitality. And then one particularly vivid example that I remember of the improvement was when I went to the dentist for my annual exam. He was surprised by how much my gum inflammation had calmed down since our last visit. Uh, and at the last visit, they had planned on doing some lasers or something to reduce inflammation because they were getting so worried. And the inflammation had turned itself around just for my new anti-inflammatory diet. I, I, did, I didn't change any other habits. So that was very interesting to learn. Uh, and by the way, one of the first and most surprising positive things that happened after I started the new protocols was that the excess weight dropped off uh, in about two months. And I must say, I was really surprised by this. I I hadn't done it for those reasons and just didn't expect it. I wasn't really exercising any more than usual. Uh, you know, and maybe I was dense, but I, I had no idea that this was possible primarily from shifting what I ate rather than from how much I ate uh, or from intensive exercise. Cause I hadn't shifted how much I ate. I was just eating different things. And those 20 pounds have stayed off for many years now. Um, so those are just a, uh, some examples of how much better I feel since changing my diet. It's really been remarkable. I'm not saying everything is perfect in my body. It's definitely not, but it's so much better. And I feel both proud and hopeful as I continue to fine tune and make more improvements. So while we're on this topic of uh, weight, let's talk a little bit more about weight management. Um, one of I know this is something that, that many folks are interested in, um, but one of the most important keys that I've come to recognize is to not try to starve yourself to lose weight. As I've been saying, just indulge in the good stuff, indulge in things that, are, that, that make you happy, but that are within the bounds of something healthy. It's more about what you eat than how much for most people. Um, there are certainly some limits and there are certain exceptions for certain people, but that's generally pretty true. Uh, and quality matters. When you nourish properly, you also help satiate. You get more sustained energy from quality foods that last. Um, also, the food you eat is typically more important than even exercise and managing weight, as I said when I sort of learned about my own journey. Research has shown that excess weight isn't primarily from lack of physical activity, though that certainly does have some impact and it's incredibly important to your overall health. Uh, however, weights is predominantly due to our food choices. Um, food has generally speaking, 
about an 80% impact versus exercise, which is at about 20%. And those are cultural averages and everyone is unique. So, you know, doesn't mean everybody fits in that bucket, but those are general trends. And another important mindset topic is that you don't want to get caught in a weight loss trap. You can't restrict calories to a substantial degree forever. Your body needs the fuel and nourishment that it needs. And what's more, calorie restriction in and of itself is just really not fun. So let me give you an example of another factor that relates to all this. Refined carbs and sugars are high in calories, but low in nutritional value. Ultimately, it's believed that you have to eat more of these foods to feel like you've consumed what you need to survive. Your body will keep pinging you with signals that it needs more deep nourishment, which you really can't get from sugar, but it makes you want to eat more. Quality fat, on the other hand, as well as veggies, fruits, complex forms of carbohydrates and good protein sources are loaded with layers of nourishment that not only fuel the body, but they also fine tune all of the intricate systems at work. They provide more nourishment per calorie and therefore are much better bang for your calorie buck. So research is also demonstrating that a nourishing diet or lack thereof can have a significant impact on our emotional well-being and mood, sometimes as much or more than psychological or other external stressors. Uh, for example, studies have compared uh, traditional diets like the Mediterranean diet and the traditional Japanese diet to a typical Western diet like ours, and they've shown that the risk of depression is 25 to 35% lower than for those who eat the Western diet. And this, you know, this whole idea of this, the mood being affected makes a lot of sense because serotonin is a neurotransmitter that helps regulates moods. And since about 95% of your serotonin in your body is produced in your gastrointestinal tract, not your brain, uh, and good gut health is heavily influenced by the food we eat. So this was really the biggest surprise to me as I got going with this diet was how significantly my mood and sense of emotional well-being changed. It even helped reduce my overall anxiety levels. It was a pretty marked change, and I was really pleased and, again, surprised for it to have positively, positively shifted. Okay, I just want to talk a minute about bigger cultural stuff. I'm talking about our planet and our health. We, I think, too often ignore our deep connection to the whole of the planet when it comes to our food choices. What we eat not only has an impact on our own health, but the health of the earth and all of its inhabitants. We're intricately interconnected to all the systems of the planet, whether we know it or not. And each of us can make a difference with the choices we make when we're buying food. So spending our money on organic, locally grown, and sustain sustainably harvested and raised food as much as we can will make a difference. It all feeds upon itself. Um, so each of us you know, can make a difference with the choices we make, as I said, when buying food or how we eat. We also need to push for policy changes so that we can better protect this delicate web of ecological systems that need to be in place to feed ourselves and tend to the larger web of life. There are better solutions, but we're going to have to use our voice urging things along. There are so many actors out there that are working against this, whether it's big giant food companies, agribusiness, there's so many people working to keep this, this uh, food machine that we currently have going in place. And it's going to take all of us stepping up by our own individual choices and our political actions to make a difference. Okay, so let's start out with pillar number one which is to eat a whole foods diet. I call this the foundational pillar because it's really the, the core of, of all of this. Um, we didn't evolve eating the artificial, chemically laced, hyper palatable foods that line our grocery store shelves today. For millions of years, we evolved eating a diet based on whole foods, obviously not Cheetos and soda. And whole foods here means food that are as unprocessed as possible. So for instance, a salad of mixed greens, blueberries, sunflower seeds, shredded carrots, avocado, radishes, 
and your favorite protein would be whole foods, while something like a box of toaster pastries uh, full of highly milled and processed flour, sugar, and artificial flavor additives uh, is not. We're adaptable creatures, but the rapid nutritional pivot we've made in modern times is not sustainable for our health. Our bodies were just not designed for it. Many of the ingredients in these highly processed foods are also known to destroy good gut microbes, uh, sometimes more commonly referred to as probiotics, which uh, we're learning are very important to our health. The multinational corporations behind most of our highly processed foods are masters at maximizing profit. They cram these foods full of preservatives to extend their shelf life. They put in cheap and often toxic alternative ingredients to cut costs, and they fill them with known addictive ingredients. In fact, these companies spend billions of dollars researching which ingredients will suck you in for more. They reap financial rewards while we pay the price. If you could do one thing to improve your health where nutrition is concerned, it would definitely be to adopt a whole foods diet as much as possible. So what does this look like? If you have uh, many foods in your house that have more than say five ingredients on the label, packaged foods in particular, you should probably toss them out, especially if there are ingredients you can't pronounce or don't sound like they come from nature. That's often not a good sign. There are of course exceptions, but this is a good rule of thumb to follow. Our body typically doesn't want or need them. Another good rule of thumb is to put your primary shopping focus on the perimeter of the grocery store. So like the outside edges, those are usually where the whole foods are like produce, meats, dairy, and so on. Uh, the shelves in the middle aisles are where most of the questionable and largely to be avoided processed foods lurk. So here are some specific examples of processed foods, talking about refined white flours and most uh, fresh or frozen uh, baked goods, most snack foods like packaged chips, cookies, crackers, candies, etc., cetera, uh, flavored sugary sodas, packaged and pre-cooked lunch meats, particularly those with loads of fillers and preservatives. Um, many frozen pre-prepared meals. There are, there are some actually some good and reasonable brands out there in, in that category, uh, but you just have to look for more natural ingredients in them. And of course, most fast food. There's, these are just a few examples. And again, be sure to check your label and see for yourself how many or fewer ingredients there are. If there's more than a handful, just be cautious and limit your exposure to these kinds of foods. Okay, now as we move into the next uh, couple of pillars, I want to talk quickly about macronutrients. There are three main macronutrients that your body uses to make energy. There are carbohydrates, which are sugars and glucose. There are lipids, which are fats, and there's protein. Each one is critical and it offers different supports for the body, but a primary function is to provide the fuel we need to operate. We need a good balance of all three to function properly. And I'm bringing these up because pillars two and three cover important macronutrients. There are also micronutrients as well, which are critical to our health, but we'll talk a little bit more about them later when we discuss uh, veggies and fruits, which are the foods through which macronutrients really shine. Okay, with that, let's move on to pillar number two reduce sugar and refined carbs, which I know is a spooky one for a lot of folks. Uh, sugar is one of the most inflammatory substances we can eat. And as many of you have already probably know, rampant inflammation is a primary cause of many diseases and of weight gain. Sugar is also one of the most addictive substances on the planet. It stimulates dopamine receptors, which are also known as pleasure centers in the brain, which can make it a real challenge to resist if you're regularly hopped up on it. But the good news is that once you shift your eating habits, the cravings for this drug do dissipate. And this particular pillar can be, as I said, the one that people have the most resistance and challenge with. But I'll give some good pointers on how to make the transition easier and some fun replacements for things that you might love. So sugars are considered a type of carbohydrate, 
It's a simple carbohydrate. And that's because like other carbs, they convert to glucose in the body. So sugars and carb and simple carbs turn into glucose, even complex carbs do, uh, which is then burned as energy. And as I said earlier, um, when our glucose levels are too high, as often happens when we consume too many sugars, especially from things like these refined carbs, like white flour, the excess sugar is often stored as body fat. So that's right. Whenever you consistently have too much glucose in the body, it triggers a rise in the hormone called insulin, which can trigger your body to deposit the converted glucose as fat into your cells for storage. And this, of course, in turn leads to weight gain. Um, these processes are actually more complicated than that, and the weight gain can be caused by many factors, but this gives you a, a broad sense of what's happening. And this is a rapidly growing problem as our sugar consumption right now is about 152 pounds a year for the average American, which seems crazy to me. Uh, that's up from about 123 in the 1970s and way up from just two pounds a year, uh, about 200 years ago. So you can see as we evolved eating, we didn't get anywhere near the amount of sugar in all its forms in our diet. Since our bodies weren't designed for this kind of diet, it's done a number on our health. That's why we have such a rapidly growing epidemic of type 2 diabetes in our society and other modern diseases. Many of these modern inflammatory diseases, uh, which I discussed earlier, and that are at epidemic levels now, were largely absent through much of human history. Um, the modern diet is certainly not the only factor in our health decline as a species, but it's one of the bigger culprits. And this is particularly true of heart disease and diabetes. We now know that some of the biggest culprits are refined sugar and carbs, as well as highly processed foods and bad fats, which we'll discuss shortly. Uh, when our blood sugar levels remain uh, elevated from our modern highly refined carb and high sugar diets, and when we consume too much inflammatory bad fat and not enough good fat, it causes inflammation as well as oxidation. Uh, these two processes are believed to be some of the biggest causes of much modern disease. Uh, research, by the way, shows that those with the highest intake of sugar double the risk of heart disease. Um, some studies have found even higher risks. Okay, so related to all of this is the challenge of high blood sugar and insulin resistance and why they are, they are such a problem for our bodies and health. So excessive carbohydrates and sugars converting to glucose in our body raises blood sugar to unhealthy levels, as I just said, and it triggers uh, excessive insulin production, which is the hormone that helps move glucose energy into your cells. Uh, it, it, it regulates our, our, our sugar. And so, and, and when it does this in greater quantities than we might need, and your body has to process this high blood sugar in this way, the more likely it is that your cells are going to become insulin resistant, which is not good. Uh, this in turn makes you need more and more insulin to process this excess glucose, which is a big driver of type 2 diabetes. And since your insulin can't keep up with the processing of the glucose, it doesn't that it doesn't need, it can trigger your body to store the glucose as fat, which is what I shared earlier. And this is especially concerning, by the way, when it's the most dangerous kind, which is belly fat, which is usually a strong indicator that you're becoming insulin resistant and at risk of prediabetes and other metabolic problems. Um, this whole process is, causes a lot of unnecessary inflammation in the body. It's believed uh, this might be one of the key ways your body becomes overrun with fat storage. Um, again, hence the weight gain. It's not the only factor, but it's worth being very conscious of as you eat. But all that bad news, the good news is that as you cut back on these inflammatory elements and your body starts to balance out, your systems will shift. There's a lot of good emerging data that nutrition and lifestyle shifts like these can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. Uh, and for most, at least improve it. Some of the numbers I've seen are up to 70% of people can reverse their type 2 diabetes where they don't have to take any medicines. It, uh, you know, sometimes it takes support from a good practitioner to get there, um, but it's worth exploring. It's pretty impressive. So 
that's it for what I'm going to share tonight about uh, pillar number two. But these are uh, a, there are additional topics that I explore further in the book uh, that we don't have time to get to in our limited time tonight. But I just wanted you all to know that these are other topics in the book if you're interested. So in the book, we'll explore why cravings can be tricky, why it can be important to have sugar and carb alternatives on hand for when those cravings and just, you know, you need the comfort food, you've got some alternatives. Uh, why fruit is great in moderation from the sugar, why you should completely avoid fruit juice. Um, I talk about the importance of timing your carbs when you get them. I talk about why high fructose corn syrup is, is really one of the worst things you can have, uh, why we need to think of refined sugar like alcohol and use it sparingly. I have some lists of better sugar alternatives uh, and those are fun to know about. They're also in that free PDF shopping guide that you should have all gotten when you registered for the webinar. So that's easy to find. It's also on my website. I talk about why artificial sweeteners are a huge no. And I give some alternatives to refined flowers, which are also in that shopping guide and lots of great options. Okay, now let's take uh, about five or so minutes for any questions you all might have on what we've covered so far. And just, you know, please keep it to what we've talked about so far. Um, and for anything else, we'll, we'll, we'll move it to the end. So this little q and is just to kind of make sure things feel clear so far. And I'd love to hear how all of this information is landing for you. How are you feeling about it all? Uh, then we'll, we'll have more time at the end. Uh, and just if you can keep questions short and sweet, just so we can get as many folks in as possible. So I'm going to pause the sharing here and um, the screen share. That's what that did. And then raise your hand. So you can raise your hand. There's a there's a little tool on the menu bar uh, that allows you to raise your hand. Uh, you can also, um, if you're on the phone, you can push star nine. So if you have any questions or just want to share kind of how it's going for you, please do. And then unmute yourself. I'll, I'll, after I call your name, Heather, go for it, please. Hi. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Hi, thanks, Matthew. Um, I find it's just always interesting to rehear things, even though you know they're important, it's nice to hear it again just to go, oh yeah, I've got to remember that. Oh, keep my eyes yeah. on that, you know, reading the labels for, you know, and I have diabetes, so type one. Mm -hmm. And, but it's just, it's, it's good to have these refreshers because sometimes yeah. after a while you can get a little lazy. So right. um, yeah, it's, it's great. Thank you. It's surprising what's in stuff too. Uh, like when we get to the fats and we talk about how some of the fats are so toxic and oils, like processed foods almost always have the bad ones, which is annoying. Even when I go to Whole Foods and places that are supposed to have healthy foods, there's just a lot of stuff. So I look and I find the brands that are, you know, they might have eight or nine ingredients, but they're good ingredients and I've learned what they are. And, and then I can indulge sometimes in those. Yes. Oh, and thanks for showing those beautiful pictures of the food because I want to make some. Of <laughs> yeah, I know thanks. everybody. Everybody wants recipes, um, which I haven't done a lot of. But I do have a few on the website. Yeah, and I have some great resources for, for really yum, yummy food on my website and that shopping guide and the book, uh, that you can go to find great, yummy, healthy, hearty recipes just like that. Great. Thanks, Heather. Welcome. Anybody else? You can... I, I can't think of um, times where you raise your hand. <laughs> oh, go ahead. This, that's checking. fine. Go, please go ahead. Hi. Um, actually, I'll start the video. My computer's a bit of a state. Um, no worries. Um, I agree with everything she was just talking about. How you know and you know and you know, but then when you see it all, you're like, wow. It's it, it puts it all into perspective. But yeah. a lot of the issues that I have, right, is I'm con. I'm confused about like the carbohydrates like is bread and rice and let's say um just sugar itself pure sugar are they all the same do they have the same effect in the body or are they different mm, good question they are a little different 
Um, surprisingly, you know, that I was talking about the blood sugar spikes and the, the insulin resistance. Uh, white bread spikes your blood sugar even more than table sugar in a lot of studies, which was surprising to me because you would think table sugar is just straight there, but there's something about the way refined carbs work in your body. So refined carbs, there is different than whole grains. So like white rice and brown rice uh, respond very differently in your body. Brown rice, because it's wrapped in fiber, it doesn't spike your blood sugar like, like white rice does. And so it's considered to be, generally speaking, considered to be healthier. Um, although there are people for, for whom they, there are a lot of like sort of cutting edge health people that say you don't touch grains for various reasons, but also for blood sugar. But generally speaking, people say if you can, it, it all goes back to the, the first pillar, whole foods. So what is the most pure form you can get something? And it's probably going to be okay if it's grown from the ground and comes from nature. Um, um, yeah. Does that answer that? Well, I can't, what else did you say? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's pretty good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, even with, with breads and, and starchy, so there are simple and carbohydrates and there are complex carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates tend to spike your blood sugar more. Complex carbohydrates, which are often in um, vegetables and fruits, for example, uh, and like starchy tubers like potatoes and, and root vegetables, they have a different reaction in your body. Some do spike your blood sugar more than others, but they come with a lot of full uh, uh, ingredients or, or comp components, which we'll talk about when we get a little bit when we get to fruit and vegetables. And I talk about it a lot in the book. Let's see. Thank I'll you take... so much. Yes, thank you, Jacqueline. So great to have you here. Uh, let's see, Dana. Um, hey, Matt. So one thing I just wanted to underscore, which I thought was really interesting and kind of the point that um, was made earlier that it's good to hear things over and over again. But one thing that I thought was really interesting, and you actually brought up tonight as well, is how sugar becomes excess fat. Like I am a woman of a certain age and my metabolism is slowed down and um I have noticed, like I thought it was carbs. So I was sort of cutting out those things, but I was um, continuing to eat sugar and I was enjoying my cocktails. And I just thought that was very interesting in your book. And I went, oh, that's actually- oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, and carbs, it's carbs and sugar both, I will say they, again, mm -hmm. technically sugar is a carbohydrate. So it's both, but yeah, we, it's, it's like, we think of the bready things as, as what mm -hmm. does that, but it's also just sugar. I, by the way, uh, you know this, Dana, but I've shifted to, I don't drink wine anymore, which I used to love, uh, or I do occasionally, but not very often. But I, if I'm going to have a cocktail, I'll use just like some spirit and I'll, I'll do bubbly water and a little lemon or lime, which is lower glycemic and some bitters and fun flavors. But I, yeah, I don't do the sweets anymore because it's just all too much. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I'll do one more conchetta. Hello, conchetta. <laughs> Hi, Matthew. How are you? Good. Good, good. <laughs> good, to, good to see you. I haven't seen yes, you in a long you time. Yes, you too. Uh, I have kind of a weird question because I have kind of a weird son. Anyway, he's always he's always tried to eat healthy and tried to, you know, eat in the salads and the veggies and the, and uh, all of that kind of stuff for a long time. But it didn't seem to make him feel better. So he started this all protein, all meat diet. And he says he feels great. Why. And he, yeah, and he can think clearer and focus better and has more energy and uh, every, all his numbers are good. Of course, his cholesterol isn't good, but he says that that's a myth, having high cholesterol. Anyway, I just was wondering what you think about all of that. Well, that's a really complex question, uh, oh. but a good one, Conchetta. Okay. Um, <sighs> I, don't know how, I don't know how much I want to even touch it because it, it, yeah, would, it would lead okay. down such a rabbit hole. Protein, mm -hmm. these high protein diets um, mm -hmm. for some people are really effective, especially if they have digestive issues and problems with their body. Long term, though, you don't mm -hmm. get all of the nutrients that you get from a whole other range of whole foods. So I don't right. know. I, I, I don't have 
I don't have a, a strong opinion to offer on that other than I think diversity is really important to a diet yes. um, from everything that I've read. Uh, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard of people that have used it short term and had a lot of healing mm -hmm. from it just as a way to kind of mm -hmm. rebalance out. And that might be really useful. I, I doubt it would be long term, but mm -hmm. it's kind of beyond the scope of what I cover in this book. I don't even get a lot into protein in the book and that's okay. a high protein diet, but um, sounds like he's explored. I know, I know. I hear a lot of these people and I know he's exploring a lot of stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully he's trusting how his body feels. That's the most important thing, by the way, any of us can do is to pay attention to how we feel when we make shifts in eating. You're not going to, all of it's theoretical because even with all of the stuff in this book, the research that they do on food is typically pretty poorly done. The only way to do phenomenal research would be to take a hundred thousand people and literally monitor everything they eat and then do it through a rigorous study. And it's pretty hard to do. Uh, there are ways to kind of cheat that and work around that. And, and that's what the, the best research does right now, but we don't really know. So what I say a lot in the book and, and I think I'll say more tonight is pay attention to how you feel when you make these changes. And you'll know you, if you feel worse, it's probably not the change for you. Sometimes we feel worse in the transition, but once you kind of clean up your diet, your senses of what your body needs and doesn't will become more acute. And that's what you really want to pay attention to. But thank you for that, Conchetta. I'm sorry. I, I, we can talk more about it at the end too, maybe uh, after we hear the rest of the stuff. So. That's all right. Thank you, Matthew. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good, good. So, um, uh, let me change these hands. Cool. Let's get rolling on the next section here. Uh, we're on to pillar number three, which is eat good fats and ditch bad fats. And it's very important to know that healthy fats provide both fuel and energy for the body's proper functioning and many additional health benefits. They can help uh, lower your risk of heart disease and stroke. They can reduce unwanted inflammation and blood pressure, decrease bad cholesterol levels and increase good ones, um, promote healthy functioning of the brain and nervous system, uh, balance metabolism and help establish healthy weight. And they're required for the absorption of some critical vitamins like the essential uh, fat soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K. Um, and you know, my generation, grew up in many, many generations around me, grew up hearing a major fallacy. We were told that eating fat made you overweight and sick. Um, but the evidence is now really clear though, that good quality whole food based fats are essential to our existence uh, and our thriving health. I just wanna mute everybody here. How do I do that? Those, if anybody, if you're not muted, if you could mute yourself, that would be great. I know there's some way that I can do it, but I don't know how. Here we go, mute all. Oh, ha, ha. I have control here. Um, okay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, when it comes to food, many of the real triggers for disease and excessive weight trend towards sugar and refined carbs and also bad fats. Our body needs these nutritional and caloric satiation to function properly. And it's really important that we eat enough good fats so that our body, our body isn't overly stressed and can perform its key functions well. This whole topic of adding more good fats into the diet, I know can be a tough one for many folks to get their heads around because of all the past demonizing of it. Um, but to be clear, even the USDA's own food pyramid was recently um, however, belatedly revised to include more healthy fat after years of irrefutable but largely ignored science singing its praises. Um, and fat and glucose burn differently in the body. Uh, and overall, healthy fat can be a more sustainable source of fuel for prolonged energy than glucose. Um, healthy fats are also nutritionally dense. This means that they can feed the body more sustained energy per calorie than refined carbs and sugar. Therefore, you get a much better bang for your buck and you're able to satiate your body more than you can with carbs or sugar when it and proper balance for your unique body. And in terms of weight management, which keeps coming up over and over, I know you guys wanna hear it. Uh, generally speaking, you have to eat a lot more carbs and sugar for your body to get the energy it needs to run than you do with fat. 
And this is a particularly important point for those of you who are trying to manage your weight, uh, myself included. Uh, having the right amount of quality fat in your diet actually tends to increase metabolism, and it leads to proper and sustained weight management and health. So when you combine this information with pillar two, which is the, you know, reducing refined carbs and sugar, your body will start to actually burn stored body fat and get your natural systems back to an appropriate level of function. And by the way, uh, the healthy fats you eat in your diet are not the same thing as stored fat in your body. They do have the same name, but that doesn't equal cause and effect. So what is healthy dietary fat? When you're not eating a source that's directly from whole food, which is a great way to get healthy fats, independent oils should be attained through expeller pressed methods. This is a way in which the oil is extracted from the nut or seed in one step, which is relying on force, uh, not heat or chemicals. And examples are eating, say, olive and avocado oil rather than eating the whole fruit, um, uh, but both have their benefits. Um, expeller pressed oils are generally healthy and provide a very nourishing food. On the other hand, industrial vegetable seed oils are typically extracted through chemical processes, often using toxic substances. And these highly processed, easily oxidizable, inflammatory and industrial vegetable seed oils, which we've been told for decades are better for us, um, are actually a big villain. Since we didn't evolve eating these highly processed vegetable oils, they've, they've actually only been around for the past century. We should avoid them and really stick to quality fats that we've been eating to great benefit for millennia. So let's go through a list of the fats and oils that are the best to ditch. Uh, and this goes against what a lot of us have learned the last few decades. Uh, we're looking at canola, soy, corn, safflower, sunflower, cottonseed, grapeseed, sesame, uh, and with sesame, it, it's, it's fine to use sesame when it's cold pressed and things like salad dressings, but not when you see it in, pro, in the labels for processed foods and it's not the best to cook with. Uh, Marjorie, hey yes. Oh, um, it's Heather. Hey. I don't know. I'm still stuck on pillar two slide. Um, oh, you are. Oh, gosh. I am, Thank but you maybe for every, saying maybe that. Every, every, maybe everybody else might be. Okay. Nope, you weren't. Mm -hmm. I hadn't resumed my slides. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Good, good. Feel free to jump in anybody if I stumble on the technology. But everybody, Thanks. thumbs up. You see the pillar three now? Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm a visual learner, so I like to see things and hear things. Uh, so another one is marjoram. Uh, even if it says olive oil, some of these new ones are a little tricky, like in the health food stores, you have to read the label and note that they usually contain other less than ideal oils mixed in. Usually canola is the first one and then olive might be third or fourth. So read your labels. Salad dressings too, as well, by the way. Uh, most nonstick cooking sprays, I know they're handy, but they have really bad oils. There are some new companies that are using avocado or coconut oils, uh, which may be better. Um, and then anything labeled vegetable oil, shortening, or with words hydrogenated or trans fat on the label, both of those are awful. Uh, and just again, remember almost all processed foods contain one form or another of these toxic fats and they all add up in your body. Um, you might be surprised to hear that around the turn of the 20th century, most of these uh, highly refined vegetable seed oils didn't even exist. Um, as manufacturers discovered a method of taking oil out of traditionally non-oily plants, they, they figured out a way to do it that became really cheap to produce and therefore became the predominant forms of fat in most people's diet. And once again, profitability can often trump health, with these big systems. Uh, it was propped up by a lot of bad science, uh, but metabolic disease rates have been skyrocketing since we switched to using these kinds of fats. And they really should be avoided. I'll talk more about why in just a minute. Uh, now, but first let's review the best types of fats and oils to eat. So olives and the oil are great, always extra virgin and cold pressed. Um, this is a lot thought to be a lot of the reason why these Mediterranean regions have such better heart health than us is because they have such high quantities of olive in their culture. Um, avocados in the oil, Coconut oil, you always want to get it virgin. It's like a way of processing it. 
palm oil is great. Um, you want to get it sustainably sourced because they often burn rainforests to get it. So you want to get some protected special forests. You can look on the labels for that. And if you're not a vegan or vegetarian, then tallow and lard are, are good from sources like grass-fed, uh, butter and ghee. The key is clarified butter. Again, also grass-fed is always best. Um, also smaller amounts of cold or expeller pressed unrefined nut and seed oils such as macadamia, walnut and sesame, as well as of course the whole oil, uh, the whole uh, nuts are great sources of good fat. Uh, flax, chia and hemp are also considered to be decent sources. And again, if you're not vegan, you can include full fat dairy, uh, you know, for the people who can tolerate it. Uh, you always, again, want to get, try to get organic and grass-fed sources, which is a much better quality fat with more higher omega-3s uh, than uh, tradition, than the standard raised. And grass-fed and grass-finished pasture-raised animal fats. So uh, diversity is important. So you just want to mix it up and get a good variety of these different fats each day. So I want to just talk a little bit more about why these bad fats are so so toxic and hard on our bodies. Um, oxidation is really one of the biggest reasons. A key risk of consuming them occurs because of this process called oxidation. When we have too much oxidation, it's really a disaster for the body. And it's another main driver of diseases, including heart disorders, cancer, and strokes. It's one of the reasons that most industrial seed vegetable oils are such a problem. The bad ones oxidize very easily. So oxidation is damage that's caused by oxygen. It's like when apples or bananas turn brown from air exposure. This happens with fats too, and it's essentially what happens inside your body when you eat oxidized oils. Uh, Dr. Mark Hyman says it's like rusting, kind of like rusting on the inside of your body. So the ensuing oxidative stress creates what's called free radicals, which are molecules that are inflammatory and can really damage your body. And we'll talk more about that when we get into vegetables and uh, fruits. Uh, but most of the bad and highly refined industrial seed vegetable oils mentioned really cause a great risk of this happening inside of you. Uh, excessive carbs and sugar also contribute to the cascade as do environmental factors and stress. Um, but heat is a particularly robust enemy for low quality vegetable oils as it can cause them to oxidize even further than they already are from just being processed. Uh, and they're often, by the way, exposed to heat during their initial processing, processing um, and as well as cooking. Cooking, it, it makes them more oxidized as well. So another um, quick note about the importance of good fat uh, in, in contrast to these bad ones. Essential fatty acids work to help the flow of communication for all the little firing synapses and neurons inside of us, particularly for our brains. And it's important to know as low quality vegetable oils provide a poor substitute for quality fats and can actually attack the brain in multiple sectors. So you wanna fill your brain up with the good quality fats that provide the best current, like electrical current through your brain possible. Um, that's really important for mental clarity. Uh, and I'm so, sorry to say this for some of you that might love it, but generally speaking, e eating deep fried foods, especially at restaurants, is one of the worst things you can do for your body. Not only do restaurants almost always use these bad oxidized vegetable seed oils for frying, they're using them for days at a time. Most restaurants don't change their oil more than once every six days, which is all that's required by law in most places. These oils become rancid really quickly and they get more and more oxidized by the day, which is amplifying the badness. Uh, the, the negative results are immediate and they also have long-term consequences. So we really should skip it. This is, this is like one of the most important things that, that you can take out of this webinar, I think, is to avoid fried foods. There are some modern brands of, of things like corn chips and potato chips, which I know people love, that was, or at least that was one of my guilty pleasures. Uh, and there are modern brands that will use coconut or avocado oil to fry them in that are probably better, they're not health foods, but if you're gonna cheat, those are good ones to, to lean towards. My favorite brands are Siete and Jackson's Honest. Uh, you know, for when you feel desperate and know you're not gonna be able to skip them. So um, 
that's all we'll talk about today with with fats. But I just want to again let you know that in the book there's some more things that I cover. Uh, I talk about how much fat you should eat, um, the cooking temperatures for fats, which is important. They all have a threshold of heat. Uh, why meat quality matters. Talk more about raw nuts and seeds, uh, olive oil, more about avocado oil, coconut and palm fats, and uh, how to find good quality fish, um, good vegan and vegetarian omega-3 fat options, which is really important. There's, there's not a lot of sources of that. One, by the way, is algae. There's some great algae substitutes for omega-3s if you're a vegan or vegetarian. Uh, talk more about full fat dairy, tips for eating fats at restaurants, how to properly store your fats and oils. And then I'll talk about, I talk more about the three types of fat, which are saturated, monosaturated and polyunsaturated and why some are better than others and off balance and stuff like that. So I'm also, again, I'm happy to talk about this stuff at the end too, if there's some topic on here that you really wanted to talk about, but I just couldn't squeeze it all in. Okay. Now we're on to our last pillar, number four, which is indulge in a rainbow of vegetables and a bit of fruit. So these are last, but they really are not least. These are the nutrient powerhouses of the food we eat. The more vegetables we can eat and fruit to a lesser degree because of the sugar, the better. In modern life, we're really faced with far too many toxins and irritants and not enough nutrients to help counteract them all. Uh, however, fresh vegetables and fruits are chock full of nourishment, which are called micronutrients. Uh, and these include vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients. And these nu nutrients provide critical support uh, for the body's vast array of working systems deep down at the cellular level. They also provide quality fiber and some wholesome carbohydrates for energy. Um, they can help convert food into energy, uh, repair cellular damage, heal wounds, strengthen bones, clean up damage done by bad fats and sugar uh, from oxidation and free radicals, and a whole host of environmental toxins. Uh, they support a functioning immune system among many other crucial supports for our body's needs. So with vegetables, we, they can be indulged in very liberally. We, in fact, the more the better. Aim for six to 10 servings per day and try to get a wide variety. Um, because of the high sugar content, fruit intake needs to be a bit more carefully monitored. Um, thankfully, whole fruit typically comes with a lot of fiber that can help slow down that sugar absorption, uh, which can help moderate blood sugar spikes. Uh, more so than refined table sugar, but one or two servings of fruit a day are, are plenty for most people, unless you're more physically active. Um, and if you're challenged with, with blood sugar issues like diabetes, you should, of course, be particularly careful. And also if weight management's an issue, you should be mindful as well. Like a handful or two of like a lower sugar fruit, such as berries or citrus, is more than enough for a day of good nutrition and sugar balance. So next, let's look a bit more closely at vitamins, uh, minerals, antioxidants, and phytonutrients as disease inhibitors. This is one of the more exciting things for me about all of this, because a lot of the, the challenges we've talked about can be directly mitigated from fruits and veggies. So more than a third of our population, by the way, uh, and some studies show over half are deficient in basic vitamins and minerals. And this is according to the recommended dietary allowance or the RDA standards, which in some cases are relatively minimal requirements based on population averages rather than populations that are more healthy. Um, and there are health experts who believe that some of the RDA standards are simply meant to keep us out of acute disease states rather than ideal health. Uh, and considering the amount of nutrients we actually need to thrive, not just survive, most of us are woefully undernourished in these important micronutrients. So taking a vitamin and mineral supplement, it certainly can have some benefit, but there's not enough adequate uh, nutrition in it for, for the deep nourishment that our bodies need. These supplements are often poorly absorbed and not highly bioavailable, meaning that a, like a rather small proportion of the, the micronutrients activate and enter the bloodstream. Plus, there's no single or even multinutrient pill or vitamin that can contain the thousands of micronutrients that are available from a whole food source. 
Um, and, and the same is true with antioxidants and phytonutrients, which we'll focus on here for a minute. These substances literally put out fires in the body. That's their job. They help undo at least some of the detrimental circumstances and choices that we inevitably face in our lives, whether they are food choices, uh, toxic environmental exposures, stress, or other less than ideal factors. Phytonutrients refer broadly to compounds that only come from plants. These are often protective substances that the plants create and use to shield themselves from the assorted harms they face. And they can do the same for us in many circumstances. And this is amazing. It's thought that various plant species contain over 100,000 different kinds of phytonutrients. Uh, in fact, they form the basis from which 40% of all of our medications are built. And we don't know what all these, these different phytonutrients do. Um, they're, they're likely very, most of them are likely very beneficial. And uh, the more we can get them from whole foods, the more we get that full array of nutrition. Now let's talk about how free radicals do their damage and how vegetables and fruit can help clean them up. So free radicals are these unstable atoms that form in the body in relation to the oxidation that we talked about and other natural processes in the body. When there are too many, free radicals can be extremely reactive and destructive to the body's proper functioning. And at the cellular level, free radicals can do serious damage to DNA, to the cell membranes, to the lipids, to the carbohydrates and protein molecules. And we often hear about them in relation to cancer, as they appear to be a, a main driver of cancer. So when the ratio of these free radicals to antioxidants gets too high, along with other factors that help regulate them, oxidative stress can become rampant and really get us into trouble. So as we discussed earlier, this oxidative stress is one of the main drivers of diseases and a whole host of challenges in the body. In addition to the uh, food-based free radicals discussed in pillar three, you know, around the oxidation with the fats, uh, we can get added exposure to them from environmental toxins, chemicals, water pollutants, radiation, could be x-rays or air travel, cigarette smoke, pesticides, air pollution, and just a whole host of other toxins. We're all exposed to these on a daily basis to varying degrees. And unfortunately, it tends to be growing how much exposure we're getting. So it's of course critical and important to minimize your exposure to these dangerous influences. But the really good news again is that antioxidants are the primary method of wrangling and neutralizing free radicals, uh, which thereby helps to shift this oxidative stress. The antioxidant molecules can safely interact with free radicals and they terminate the chain reaction that uh, causes oxidation uh, before other fundamental and, and healthy molecules are damaged in the body. As such, they're essentially one of the body's primary antidotes to disease causing forces. And of course, what is a primary source of antioxidants for our bodies? Uh, vegetables and fruit. So they're just critically important. Okay. So that kind of wraps up that section too, but here's again, some of the other topics that I explore in the book. Um, we talk about cooking and preparation, uh, raw versus cooked vegetables, uh, fresh, frozen, or canned, which is better. Fresh and frozen are much better than canned, FYI. Well, quick tip. Uh, the importance of going organic. Uh, talk about the, the, the really powerful benefit, benefit of fermented veggies and fruits. Uh, prebiotics, which feed probiotics, the good gut bugs. Talk about herbs and spices and why they're so important. Um, they're very nutrient dense, by the way, herbs and spices. When they're fresh, you get so much micronutrients built into those little, little fellows. Uh, talk about how to work with salads, how to work with smoothies, have a little section on sweet potatoes versus russet. Sweet potatoes tend to be much easier on the body than russet potatoes. And garlic. Um, yeah, that's it. So there's other, that kind of wraps up the pillars, but I just want to again quickly share that beyond the four pillars, I explore some other important issues relating to food and lifestyle supports in the book. 
And so I'll just quickly read through some of them. I have more tips on food and nutrition, like protein, salt, and snacking. I talk about good gut health and the critical importance of healthy digestion and how to improve, improve yours. Uh, I talk about uh, cooking power tips, how to make the best use of time and make delicious foods that are healthy. Uh, proper hydration. Water is a life force and we need to get plenty to keep our bodies in proper flow. And then I talk about the psychology of change, uh, how to find the inner motivation to achieve your goals successfully. And then finally, here are some healthy lifestyle tips that I explore in the book. Uh, I talk about emotional wellness and stress reduction, uh, minimizing household and environmental toxins, sunlight nutrients, movement and exercise, uh, the healing power of sleep, and then our collective needs and how we can build resilient community and work for social change. So before I wrap it up and we move on to the, the Q&A time, which I'm running a little late, I just want to share a few more thoughts about how, how to hold all of this information in a way that can help you make changing your diet and lifestyle a victory. Uh, so many of us jump into dietary changes and have inevitable missteps, uh, you know, and when they pile upon one another, they can lead to getting derailed and going back to old patterns. Most of us know this about ourselves by now, um, but just, just know that you don't have to make all these kinds of changes overnight. Some, some of you may be ready to dive deep, and if you truly are, you know, good on you, but we're all different, and there are others of us who may need to pick the things that are the most inspiring and take it on step by step. It's all great. Uh, just, you know, for example, if sugar and refined carbs are your biggest challenge, and let's say you eat seven servings a day from cereal or that cereal or bagel for breakfast to the sandwich at lunch or crackers or chips as snacks in the afternoon, and then the garlic bread with your pasta for dinner, plus the serving or two of desserts afterwards, you might try taking one of these items out for the first week and then pulling, you know, another one out on the second or third week and just kind of keep that process rolling. Just keep chipping away at it. Baby steps are totally fine. It's better than the alternative. Um, you really have to be realistic with yourself uh, to where you're at. Of course, you'll need to find your comfort zone and lean into it. Uh, you just don't want to blow yourself out. So give yourself realistic challenges uh, to clean up your diet. And finally, it's easy for many of us to berate ourselves when we fall off the wagon, but be gentle with yourself and just get back on it celebrate even your little victories. Uh, if you set a daily goal or a meal goal and you meet it, take a few moments and acknowledge and revel a bit in it. There's actually good neurological science showing that this is an important way to change habits. Make this a playful and fun experience. You're taking a big step to loving yourself and taking better care of yourself. Uh, good for you. Celebrate that. Um, and these are just some more resources. I'm not going to read over them right now, um, but there's tons of stuff on my website. Obviously, there's the book. Um, there's a new audio, audible audio book came out with it as well. Um, but check out my website for tons of resources. If you don't want to buy the book, um, I have a free ebook and an MP3 as well that you can get, which is kind of like the, the uh, Cliff Notes. Uh, so there's plenty of healthy, uh, plenty of great information there. But I want to shift now and just open it up to questions, comments, anything, anything you want to do. And again, for some of you who can't find the hand raising tool, uh, if you're on Windows, you can use Alt plus Y on the keyboard. That's a shortcut. If you're on a Mac, you can use Option plus Y. And if you're on the phone, you can uh, dial star nine. So please, if you have anything, let me turn the sharing off. Cool. We can see each other a little bit, a few of us anyway. Let's see, Nanny. This was awesome. Thank you Thank so much. You. Um, I do have a question, specifically a pillar three question. And nice. I'm looking at page 83 of my awesome book. Oh, good. I, I'll, I just I'll look at it with you. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say this to everybody. I went, I had a, like my annual checkup today and I took my book to my doctor and he was so excited. I actually took a picture of him. He's 
like, oh, nice. oh my God. I showed him the overview. He's like, I'm ordering four copies today. This is oh, great. Good. Oh, I good. Know. That's awesome. Cool. He's two thirds of the way through his functional uh, medicine certification. Oh, beautiful. Anyway. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's my question specifically about oils. And um, my question is, is the key, and this is on page 83, and this kind of seems like it is, is the key that um, I'm going to go with expeller pressed. Like that's like a word I would never have used before. Right? right. But if I see like, for example, you know, in the back of the book, you, you talk about the oils that you love mm -hmm. and your avocado oil is by that. I don't know if it's Italian or French La Tourangelle. Yeah. I you cannot know? say it. Right? It was hard when I did the audio book when I had to actually read that. Word. Oh, okay. Well, I just had fun playing with it anyway. So that, that same company makes a grapeseed oil that's expeller pressed. And I love using that uh -huh. uh, for sauteing like my salmon, cause you can, it, you can go to a high heat with it, but it's expeller pressed. But then, in so I got a little confused about well, so, the key piece of it. So if it, there might be a good grapeseed yeah. that is, that's my- yeah. I think it's possible. So there's debate about okay. that topic, whether, whether some of the oils, like you can find cold pressed canola as well. <clears throat> the problem with canola and even grapeseed is they're so tiny, like grapeseeds are minuscule and they have to, they have to often use uh, chemicals to get it, get some of it out. But when they expel or press it, you know, you get a cleaner oil. It's just, I, I can't answer it because there's debate. Like some people say things like grapeseed or again, or sesame when they're cold pressed, they're, they're much better. They're higher. I, I didn't get in this tonight. They're higher in polyunsaturated fats, which we get far too much of in our diets. We already get like, I oh, wish I had the number. I think I may have the number. I think it's 20 to one. I say it in the book. It's about, yeah, 20 to one ratio of omega six to omega nine. Oh, and the today. omega nines are these monounsaturated fats. That's like what olive oil is. That's what you hear about the Mediterranean diet. They're much higher in these omega nine fats. When we evolved, just what they think we need is we need more of a two to one or a four to one ratio of like omega three and omega nine compared to those omega sixes, which can be more inflammatory. And so I believe, I don't want to Google this, check out what the levels are, grapeseed oil of, of the, the polyunsaturated fat, okay. the omega six. I, 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 I just kind of went with the safest information for this, but there are a few of these oils that you might check. I use avocado to, to cook with, a, it, it tolerates a much higher heat. Okay. It's more stable and it's higher in the monounsaturated fats. That's great. That that's yeah. perfect. That, that can be my new, that can be my new one. So, so it's not, so just overall, so it's not, it's not that simple. It's, it's not, not, it's not, yeah. not everything that's expeller pressed. If you get the good oils I listed, you definitely want to get them expeller pressed. That's part, a big part of why I put that in there. So the olive and avocado are important to get expeller pressed. Okay. Um, it's a question mark about the others. Okay. Thank Sorry. you so much. Yes. Thank you. Okay. What else did I see? Gee, did you change your mind? Anyone else with questions? If you're having a problem raising your hand, by the way, just unmute and, and chat. I see Gia, good. You have to unmute Gia. Hello. Hello. Um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the oxidation. I think the clearest understanding I had was the banana. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted a little more on that. I found well, that I, beautiful. good, yeah, thanks, good. Um, it's really like one of the most toxic parts. I mean, I, I did, again, I didn't get into tonight, but there's these also the types of fat and they can be more inflammatory and you have to balance that. But the, the bigger thing is these, these industrial seed vegetable oils, they just oxidize very easily. And usually the process of, they, they use a chemical extraction method for the most part, especially for processed foods. And that chemical is, first of all, not good for us. It's toxic, but it oxidizes the oil immediately just by the way it's produced. They use heat too. And both of those things create this, this oxidation. And then uh, they sit on the shelves. They sit in our houses. We heat them, which creates more. And you just get this kind of growing risk of oxidation. Um, oxidation 
you know, when I talked about free radicals, they f uh, during vegetables and fruit that are the cause, they screw up your cells and your DNA and create cancer and they can create tumors when they're out of balance. Um, oxidation is one of the big drivers of the free radicals. So it's just, it's just oxygen. When, when something is exposed to oxygen, it oxidizes that can, things that can be oxidized, oxidize. That's why I use the, the example of the banana, because we see that, that is oxidation. And it doesn't mean bananas and apples are bad. It's a whole different, it's just a whole different kind of uh, what's going on in your body. That's, first of all, just the surface that's, a, that's an issue. Whereas these um, oils are saturated, it's, it's all the way through them, it's in their very structure. The other thing about oxidation, um, like when we grill, meats, for example, even vegetables to a certain degree, all of that brown charred stuff, that's like oxidized material that does that same thing. It, it, it amplifies the free radicals in your body. So it's really important when you cook anything, I didn't talk about this tonight, but it's in the book, uh, to, to lean towards grilling just for special occasions, even sauteing just for special occasions. Or if you're gonna saute, go with a lower heat and just take a little bit longer so they don't get quite as browned. I mean, it's fun. If it's a Friday night, you got somebody over, you wanna wow them with a delicious meal, it's, it's okay to do this. If you're gonna eat, for example, meats, if you're not vegan, um, and you're gonna grill it and you're gonna get all that black, make sure you've got a salad with it. Because literally the salad does this, or the vegetables or, or fruit or something, they do it instantly. They, they start to grab the free radicals that are formed from that oxidation uh, in your stomach while you're eating. I mean, it starts immediately that process. So if you eat a lot of vegetables when you do grilled, you know, meats or even grilled vegetables, I guess the, <laughs> I guess the antioxidants in the grilled vegetables probably do something similar. But um, that's one way to counteract it. That's, you know, I think, Gia, that's kind of like what I can say about it. I can't think of anything else to say about it. Is there anything else in particular? Or is that good? No, that was really great. Thank you. Especially the idea of adding on uh, vegetables just to counter because mm -hmm. I am a meat eater and uh, I don't think of myself as charring my food, but I do love sauteing almost everything. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I've gotten, by the way, really uh, excited about, uh, oh, and I'll look at the chat window too, in case people are asking questions there, but I've gotten really excited about my pressure cooker. I use an instant pot. It just is spectacular in the way it's, it's quick. It's easy. It infuses the food with these flavors. Um, I use a little broth as the liquid at the bottom, and then I put lots of fresh herbs. And you get these incredible, it makes everything just so flavorful and delicious. And you, it's, it's basically, it's pressurized steam. So you don't get these oxidized chemicals. So I use that daily. And then for, you know, on the weekends, once or twice a week, I'll make a stir fry, you know, and I just get my big cast iron La Creuset uh, wok and I'll put in my avocado oil and a bunch of cut up vegetables and leeks and, you know, fennel and everything and herbs and, and, uh, and then I uh, just have fun. And I know that I'm, you know, doing it for fun. Uh, let me check the chat. Ooh. Okay, cool, cool. Well, if any last chance, if anybody else has any questions or comments or, or anything, go for it. Otherwise, I can wrap it up. What do you think of keto? Well, I think it's very interesting. You know, this diet is pretty keto, uh, keto friendly. Um, keto involves several things. It involves, you know, usually you have to have fasting windows. I'm, I basically am on a ketogenic diet myself uh, and I have found it to be really helpful. Like it's probably the most impactful thing that I've done. And again, if you're on this diet as it is, you're, you're already going to be much more towards keto because you're reducing your carbs and sugar, you're getting healthier fats, and you're eating nutrient-dense foods. Um, keto, so this, usually they, they, they push for a window between eating of at least 12 hours. Most of the real ketogenic diets will say like 16 hours, sometimes 18 hours. So between when you eat dinner, 
for example, and then you eat the next day, it's usually around lunch. And that's what I do. I start my day with the salad, usually around 11 or 12. I try to wrap up my food the night before around eight, depends on the night from snacking or not. But um, I feel so much better when I give myself that window. There's a lot of things around it. You, you're able to digest better. You, it gives your, your, your digestive system a chance to rest and all your microbes to balance out. Uh, it, it helps stabilize blood sugar. People who are diabetic and or of either type really do really often like well on ketogenic diets and can rever again reverse their, you know, not, not type one, but type two people can reverse their diabetes where they don't even need the medications or the insulin. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really interesting data emerging. They're still really studying it. Some studies are showing that it's really beneficial for about a year and then it kind of tapers off. Some studies are showing, you know, a lot of benefit, but this whole idea of fasting, that's a big part of it. If you look at a lot of cultures, like there's some, there's an island off, off of Japan. I can't think of the name right now, but they have the longest lifespan in the world and they do reg daily fasting. So they have long windows of 16 hours between eating. Mm -hmm. And it's shown to be just really remarkable. It changes your whole cellular structure, your DNA. So I, I'm interested in it. I think we'll keep learning over time as they keep doing studies. You know, some of the studies that are saying it's bad are bad studies. Like they're not really, <laughs> they're, not, they're not done very well or, or short terms, or they, use, they don't use really good quality food as a barometer. They'll just use fasting windows or high fat, like high bad fats, like canola oils and that kind of stuff. So you've got to, if you do keto, by the way, from, I didn't, I don't think I said this, it's often high fat, low carb, but like really high fat people eat a lot of fat. And I do, I eat about a, gosh, over a hundred grams of fat a day, which I know like me, the me that was in my twenties would have croaked if I had ever thought I would do something so evil like that after what they taught us. But when I did that, like I lost all that weight. I, my mm -hmm. cholesterol numbers radically improved. I felt better. I, I don't have to snack in the afternoon. In fact, I rarely do. I used to just graze all day because I just that needed that blood sugar spike. Um, and now I can go such a long time. Mm -hmm. And some days if I have to like fast for an entire, like most of the day, um, I can do it. I never, I mean, I, you know, it was just like always hungry or thought I was. Before. So anyway. Long answer. Thanks, Roberta. Well, that's uh, I've been doing the, the keto fasting lifestyle now for three, three and a half years. How's it and feel for you? I, oh, fantastic. Um, I've lost 72 pounds and kept it off. And I've never mm. had anything that became a lifestyle before. And right. this is a lifestyle now. And it works. And I'm happy and I'm satisfied. And I'm not a slave to the food anymore. So and if beautiful. anybody would have told me that before, and I still have people, even people I live with that think I'm insane and I'm going <laughs> to die. And, you know, my, my blood tests are better than they've ever been in my whole life. Yeah. My, my cardio risk, you know, if you do the waist to height ratio, which is what they're using now is the, the, the prime means of determining mm -hmm. your cardiac health and that, and mine's under the 50%. It's been down under 40, 47, 48 for months and months and months and months. And all this Beautiful. stuff. So basically I have, I have a family that's massive cardiac history, everybody mm. dying from cardiac and strokes and all this stuff. And I have no risk at this point in time. That's so I, I don't care what people say um, anymore. I, <laughs> I agree. I think the most important thing is to pay attention to how you're feeling again, mm -hmm. not always in, immediately. Cause for example, when we start to reduce sugar and carbs, we can often get uh, withdrawal <laughs> symptoms, literally like drugs because they are. Um, but once you kind of balance out and you're trying something new, you can start to kind of play around with fiddling with things and see how you feel on a little more carb, a little less carb, a little more fat, a little less fat. And it's remarkable how you can tune in and feel it. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're feeling good, I mean, if you were feeling bad before, which I'm guessing you were to make the change, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> like, how could that be better? Yeah, I weigh 210 that, you know? pounds. Yeah. And I'm five foot five and I, my yeah. cholesterol was high and I was pre-diabetic and yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. not good. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Robert. <laughs> I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dana. Um, okay. So I have a, a question. It might be a little unfair, but we, thank goodness. I think we're all starting to maybe 
uh, go out in the world again and with the pandemic mm-hmm. and that includes going to restaurants and other places that, um, you know, it's one thing to kind of try these things in sort of our closed environments and all that, but do you have any tips of maybe some, just some, I think I remember reading one in the book, but you know, any, any tips as you kind of think about how, you know, what you're going to be doing when you go back out to restaurants and, you know. Yeah, I'm excited. That's what, as I've said to you, Matt, it's like that. I think that's the thing I'm most excited to do. Again. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I guess, you know, maybe we have to start outside first, but um, I can't wait. Um, well, a couple things on that I would say. First is what a lot of people call the 80 20 rule, which is 80% of the time do the best you can and 20% don't sweat it. So I do. At first, I was really hardcore, and now I'm a little gentler with myself when I go to restaurants and I'm just like, all right, you know. If it's a good quality thing, and it's mostly Whole Foods, I'm, I'm, you know, I just kind of let it ride. But um, there are times, and depending on where I'm going, there's a few tricks. One, most, the biggest problem in restaurants is the fats. Um, that they, they usually will use the canola oils and that kind of stuff when they're cooking and sautéing and frying and all that kind of stuff. So what I often do, and I do do this, even though I do try to follow the 80-20 rule, I'll just see like, like let's say if I have a side of vegetables with something, I will, they always steam them first. Really, they boil them first, but they call it steaming. I used to work in restaurants, so I figured this out. Um, they steam them first, and then they usually will quickly saute them at the end because it, it makes it faster to cook it. Um, and they'll usually use that bad oil. So I know they do that. So I either will just say, hey, can you send it to me steamed and give me a side of butter uh, or olive oil? And then I'll just do it myself. Or if I'm feeling brave, sometimes I'm not, uh, I'll ask them, could they possibly saute it in butter instead of their oil? Because even when, I hate to say this, but even when restaurants have uh, olive oil, it's often a blend of olive and canola or safflower. So I don't like them cooking with it. Um, Butter's fine. It's saturated fats are very stable in heat. And so, uh, and we need a little saturated fat in our diet. Again, I didn't talk about that tonight, but it's important. So it's a, that's a fun one to ask for. And often they'll say, sure, the chef said fine. Um, or I'll just say, can you just steam it and bring it out and I'll do my own thing with it. And I put butter, you know, I'll use their olive oil, even if it's a mix, at least it's not heated. So it's fine. I I use that as my 20% rule. That's the biggest thing I think I do. The biggest tip that I would offer. Thank you. Cool. I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so I think we can wrap it up. But, you know, thank you guys for being here. So appreciate it. You know, good luck on this journey. It's uh, it's a powerful thing to take on. And it's not just like a diet. It's really a lifestyle shift. Uh, and I hold it that way. It's something that can really sustain and nourish me. And I hope it does for all of you. So any blessings and uh, thanks for coming appreciate it enjoy the journey thank you thanks man thank you care karen